drive home can turn ugly when a snowstorm threatens to stop you in your tracks. It's a winter storm freezing. The snow gets deeper as you plow ahead. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Don't make it. I can barely see it without I have to wipe the window. It might surprise you that this situation can be deadly. Literally, the snow is right at the top of the door. It's near the window. It's like I'm in a cave. What would you do if you were stranded in the snow? Would you A. Abandon your vehicle and go find help B. Stay put and crack the windows open so you won't suffocate Or C. Keep the engine running so rescuers can locate you Consider your options. You could be in serious danger. As you venture out and the conditions are snowy, you have to be aware of situations that may leave you stranded, whether it's driving off of a highway or turning on to a rural road that has a lot of snow pack on it. Driving in ice and snow is very dangerous. It's easy to lose control. You panic and you find yourself in a situation where it can lead to a crash. Vehicles are built to insulate themselves from a sound standpoint. There isn't insulation like you have in your home in a vehicle to really protect it and create a cocoon for yourself. At 75 North Mile 240, be my gravestone because my batteries are dying. Once your vehicle runs out of gas, it literally becomes a freezing cold tin can, which offers very little insulation from the cold temperatures. We've been in here for like 20 minutes and I can still see my breath. It's like 12 degrees outside. A common mistake when stuck in snow for an extended period of time is getting outside and trying to dig yourself out. Now you're freezing and is absolutely a risk for hypothermia. Stranded in snow, you have a tough choice. If they don't get me in enough time, I could, my car could be covered completely in snow. I could be... Uh, barricaded under here. I don't know if I'll suffocate. I don't know what will happen. What would you do if you if you were stuck in your car in a snowstorm? Your best bet? B. Crack the windows open. That's because you'll need to intermittently run the car for heat. And that creates a deadly byproduct, carbon monoxide. Assuming that your vehicle is still in running condition and you still have ample fuel, you're going to want to start the engine approximately every 20 to 30 minutes to get the heater going again. One of the things you have to be concerned about uh, if you have your vehicle and you're running the engine is the buildup of carbon monoxide. And you wouldn't normally notice this uh, in the vehicle as you drive down the highway because it's exhausted out the tailpipe. But once you're stopped and your tailpipe either potentially gets clogged or covered because of the snow, it could start to seep through the exhaust system in the vehicle and enter the vehicle itself. It has no odor and is very dangerous because uh, breathing an increased amount of carbon monoxide is deadly.
you'll feel sleepy, you'll start to feel dizzy, and you also will start vomiting. But that will be a short period before you will lose consciousness. Nearly 150 people die in the U.S. every year due to accidental carbon monoxide poisoning in their cars. It's very important to crack your windows on the vehicle periodically, not too much because it's extremely cold outside, but also to periodically get out and make sure that your tailpipe is not covered and dig away the snow from around your tailpipe if you're continuing to run the vehicle as a source of heat. So if you've cracked the windows open, why shouldn't you just keep the car running? Uh, so I got a little less than a quarter of a tank. And that's keeping me warm at this moment. It's very difficult to make that decision sometimes. Do I keep the car running? Do I not? Based on the amount of fuel I have. So very important to maintain as full as possible fuel tank. As for abandoning your car to go get help, some of the dangers of walking away from your car are you are separating yourself from a large object that's easier to spot. In addition, you are exposing yourself to the elements. So you can suffer from hypothermia, you can become disoriented or lost even in an urban area. I've been stuck out here going on 10 hours. I have some butter bites that I had from Saturday. Luckily, they were still in the car. So I have something to eat. Caught in nearly two feet of snow near Chicago, this driver was lucky to eventually be rescued. But you can't rely on luck. Keep your tank full in winter months. And if you get stranded, stay with your vehicle. Crack the windows open. And turn on the car every 20 to 30 minutes to run the heater. Oh my gosh. This is crazy. Keep warm and you should survive this wintertime horror. Hiding under nearly every main street in the nation, a catastrophe waits to erupt. caused by broken water mains, high pressure underground pipelines, and when the temperature drops below freezing, old pipes can burst without warning, swamping vehicles and swiftly drowning entire neighborhoods in icy water. So what would you do if a ruptured water main suddenly flooded your car, trapping you inside? Would you A. Exit your car and run to dry ground. B. Stay inside your car until help arrives. Or C. Drive away as fast as possible. It helps to know what you're up against. When we're dealing with some very cold outbreaks of weather, there could be some heightened concerns for water main breaks, especially in those areas where that pipe itself is not too far below the surface. Well, for a pipe to burst, the water in it has to freeze. This happens when you have really, really cold for a long period of time, and when water freezes, it expands, and that's why you break. Water main breaks can be caused by faulty securing of the pipes. You know, also be from a rock or something rubbing the pipe over time, damaging the pipe. Normally the pipe connections themselves are secure until something like that happens. There's a lot of pressure that has to go through that pipe in order to force that water into all those outlets. So when we do have a water main break, all that... The break... Trapped in your car, surrounded by frigid water. Cold temperature affects, affects the body by dropping your core body temperature. Oh my God, it's so cold. You'll get the gasping, you'll get shivering. If you're there long enough, it'll, it, your muscles will start to get weak and you could even have a little bit of impaired judgment. On top of the glacial cold, 
there's the crushing force of the water itself. It only takes about 18 inches to 20 inches to float a car. That car only has to be floating one inch off the road, and now the current moves it. The biggest determining factor is the weight of the vehicle. It also determines on whether they're facing upstream or whether they're facing sideways in the current. If a car is facing the current, it's harder for the water to move it from front to back. But if a car is sideways, there's more surface area where the car can move. So that water is being pushed into the outlying soil. Water main breaks can cause a lot of damage. And there you are. What would you do if a flood from a broken water main trapped you in your car? Unless you are in imminent danger from the water or cold, you should choose B. Stay in your car and wait for rescue. If you are caught in your car in a flooding situation, stay in your car. Everybody has a cell phone. Call for help. Tell them exactly where you are. Don't try and get out of the car on your own. You don't know what the road surface is like underneath of you. Fast moving water can wash the pavement away while you're sitting there. And to help with the intense cold, as long as you can still run your car's engine, you can run the heater. But if you choose to exit your car, the results will be far more chilling. There's a lot of force with that water. So trying to walk somewhere, there's a good chance you might get, you know, pushed over and now you're submersed in cold water. You'll have that cold shock response. You might gasp and hyperventilate. Cold water really diminishes how far you can swim and how much work you can do. Getting out of your car in a water main break or even flooding conditions is a mistake. If rocks and trees and boulders can't stand up to the current, I don't think you will either. Water starts coming into your car, then open your window so you'll have an escape route, and then if you have to, get on your roof, but don't try and cross the water. What about hitting the gas and simply driving away? see water on the road, I don't care what you're driving. Do not go in. Don't drown. Turn around. You may be targeting the other side of the moving water and be pushed downstream and then therefore no longer have an exit. A flash flood and a water main break are really no different. It's water moving in a rapid direction. It doesn't matter what the source of that water was. You may not know what a water main will break near you. But if it should, know not to panic. Protect yourself by staying for help and wait to be rescued. Keep as warm as possible. If you can, keep calm and stay dry. You might stand a chance of surviving an icy dew. The sun is shining and the powder is pristine. You're skiing in the backcountry, feeling on top of the world, when suddenly, the snow below you breaks free. Oh my God! It's an avalanche. Now, what do you do? Would you, A, curl into a ball and roll with the falling snow? B, stay upright and steer yourself away from obstacles like trees and boulders. Or C, immediately ski to the side to get out of the avalanche. You have one choice and one chance to escape. But first, what is this snowy killer? An avalanche, in simple terms, is a slide of snow that actually lets go on a slope of a hill or mountain, either in a slab or different types of configurations. The power and the weight of avalanches as they move down a mountainside can literally take out trees and just put a tremendous scar through regions. We're talking about hundreds of acres of snow all at once descending down and usually concentrating itself in a 
fairly small area. Large avalanches can reach speeds of 200 miles an hour. Caught in the wrong place, a human barely stands a chance. Over 150 people die every year in snow slides. Contrary to popular belief, avalanches aren't triggered by loud noises. The most common cause is the added weight of the victims themselves. No, unless they can actually feel or hear the collapse. There's sometimes a dropping of the snow. They can actually to the snow that's called boom. And that's exactly how it sounds. You hear the sound. You feel the snow below you slip. So what would you do to survive an avalanche? If your answer was C, skiing to the side to escape the snow, you disaster. Get back! The object is, if you see one coming or if you find yourself in one, is try to go 90 degrees to the fall line in either direction. The best skier is not going to outski an avalanche. You want to get to the side as quickly as possible to get out of it. Sweet! Four! Some alternatives the people have to getting off to the side. You can get to a tree that you can get your arms fully around. You just may be able to let most, if not all, of the snow pass around you. But what if, despite your best efforts, you're still swept away by the avalanche? You don't want to get into a ball because that's just going to turn you basically into a ball of snow and maybe just get you hurtling down the hillside. But one of the things that you can do if you're really going for a ride is try to keep your body oriented so you're in a semi-sitting position and you're basically using your arms kind of like a backstroke so you're facing downhill, head up. dragged to the bottom and buried in snow. Then what? If you were buried in an avalanche, what could you do now to stay alive? Should you A. Dig an air pocket from around your face. B. Pee in the snow to help rescue dogs locate. Immediately call out so witnesses can find you. Though you may have heard some skiers recommend B, and you probably want to yell for help, the truth is A is the best choice as the snow settles around you. If you're going to do any moving, it has to be done while the avalanche is moving. Once the avalanche stops, it sets up, and you're literally encased in ice. It just ends up swallowing you like wet concrete, and you're just kind of frozen in place almost. But if you have a free arm or something, then you want to concentrate on creating an airspace in front of your face. Taking an air pocket around your mouth is about the most important thing you can do if you have been caught, carried, and buried in a snow avalanche. What that does is that allows exhaled air to dissipate out and away from your face. If it can't do that, you rebreathe your own air and you actually have a carbon dioxide toxicity, which is the major cause of death. In fact, the air around you is so limited, you shouldn't waste it by calling out for help, unless you can hear rescuers nearby. while you're buried in snow? This 
is a myth. Dogs who are trained to find avalanche victims don't necessarily follow that scent any better than all of the other kinds of scents that we're giving off. So that offers no advantage. But what if you're not the victim? What if you're a witness? Right before your eyes, a wall of white overtakes a helpless skier. So what's the best thing for you to do if you see someone caught in an avalanche? Do you, A, rush to the base of the hill and get ready to dig the victim out? B, wait for more help to arrive before taking action? Or C, watch the avalanche closely and track where the victim ends up? The right thing to do? is C. Keep your eyes on the victim. One of the first and most important things to do is to glue your eyes. We want to watch two things. We want to watch for them as they go down. We also want to watch the flow of the avalanche. If a person disappears, kind of make an imaginary spot on that snow and watch that snow go down because that speeds up certain for the most likely burial place. Your choices can mean the difference between life and death. If an avalanche is barreling down on you, quickly move to the side, away from the racing snow. If you see a sturdy tree, grab onto it. As the snow slides to a stop, push an arm or leg to the surface. Dig a space around your mouth to create an air pocket. Most importantly, stay calm while rescuers work to find you. Avalanches are terrifying forces of nature, but if you're prepared, they are survivable. Untouched powder and a 500 pound snowmobile going full throttle. This is what bliss looks like for a wintertime adrenaline junkie. Every snowbank brings the promise of fun. And who knows what thrills can be found just over the next. Too bad this is just a prologue to the real pain. Side of Alaska, where was the coldest temperature ever recorded to date in the United States? A. Colorado, B. Montana, or C. Wisconsin? Outside of Alaska, where was the coldest temperature ever recorded to date in the United States? High up in the mountains in Rogers Pass, Montana, a bone-chilling 70 degrees Fahrenheit below zero was recorded on January 20th, 1954. If you include Alaska, the coldest temperature ever recorded was negative 80 degrees at Prospect Creek in 1971. Welcome to snowmobile heaven. Last night, a blizzard dropped a few feet of snow on your wilderness playground, giving you and your buddies miles and miles of fresh powder to ride on. But when you ride off alone on a solo adventure, little do you realize that epic moment of triumph is about to become an extended journey of pain. out from the brutal crash and when you awaken you discover you're fighting a critical battle ah. against frostbite what would you
you do to treat this cold, harsh condition? Should you A. Rub the afflicted areas, such as hands and feet, to increase circulation? B. Soak your frozen extremities in hot water? Or C. Gently wrap your frostbitten limbs and keep them dry? What you do next could save your life and limbs. But what exactly is frostbite anyway? Frostbite is actually a condition where the skin tissue actually begins to freeze. We think about our fingers and toes getting cold at first, and eventually you'll see discoloration of the skin uh, in advanced cases. Under cold temperatures, the body is going to try to maintain its core body temperature so it does not get hypothermia. And one of the ways it does that is by constricting the small blood vessels in the tissue far away from the core, such as the hands and feet. Eventually, the tissue temperature is going to drop to freezing and ice crystals are going to develop. So frostbite is tissue injury when you actually have temperatures that develop ice within the human body. Frostbite can occur when the temperature of the skin drops below freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We develop frostbite is going to depend on the temperature as well as the wind speed. Are your extremities covered or not? Are you active currently? And so all those factors come into play when you try to figure out how long it will be or if frostbite is likely to develop. At 20 degrees with wind Winds a mere 15 miles an hour, frostbite can take hold in less than 30 minutes. With lower temperatures or a higher wind chill, that time can drop to just a few minutes. The physical signs that you have will let you know that you're having frostbite. It's usually intense pain uh, around the, uh, the sites. It's often the extremities that tend to freeze first. Be warned, this will get ugly. First degree frostbite, you do have the numbness. You'll have an area that's white typically, and the surrounding tissue is going to be swollen. Within the second degree, you'll see blistering. And so that blistering will have typically clear or a milky fluid in it. Yeah, the skin's eventually going to die and come off. Third degree of frostbite, you still have blistering, but they're purple or red because the damage to the tissue has gone down deeper. And then fourth degree, you may see auto amputation where parts of skin die, they become necrotic and fall off of themselves off of themselves or mummification and there you are you survived the horrific treetop collision but you've been out cold in the freezing cold long enough to suffer frostbite so what would you do to survive it your best chance of saving your extremities is c make sure you loosely wrap up the frostbitten areas and keep them dry as possible you want to be dry and you want it to be wrapped gently right because we don't want to rub or abrade the tissue it's it's sensitive because of the ice crystals and so loosely fitting dry wrap helps mitigate the heat loss and prevent tissue damage when it's most vulnerable after gently wrapping up the damaged skin, you should get to a hospital. This is a very dangerous injury that can have very life-changing consequences. It often requires a multidisciplinary team of focused experts. And so for those reasons, it's not advisable to try to treat it on your own. As for soaking your frozen limbs in hot water, you may thaw the skin before your blood circulation returns. Do that and the skin dies. That's why it's best to leave the rewarming to medical professionals. Ideally, you want to place the limb in a, uh, a whirlpool water at about 99 to 102 degrees. And this seems to be the narrow but ideal window for rewarming. Generally speaking, rewarming should be a passive activity. If it took you an hour to get cold, it should take you an hour to warm back up. Unfortunately, the rewarming process can be painful. The rewarming 
portion goes from an area of no sensation to sharp, severe, and throbbing pain. If soaking in hot water is a bad idea, rubbing a frostbitten area is even worse. So because frostbite involves those tiny ice crystals, those ice crystals are very damaging to cell walls. And so by rubbing, you're really abrading the ice crystals against tissue, and you can further cause damage when you're only attempting to help your injury. In extreme circumstances, frostbitten extremities such as feet, toes, hands, and even legs must be amputated. Always be aware of the risks in freezing weather. Keep covered at all times. Insulated clothing such as gloves and a mask can save your skin. But if you do get frostbite, wrap the frostbitten areas with clean, dry, loose bandages or a towel. Then seek medical attention immediately. Don't rub the affected areas or attempt to warm up in hot water. Frigid weather is fraught with danger, so stay warm or end up frozen. What will you Which of these behaviors can make you more susceptible to frostbite? A. Smoking. B. Exercising. Or C. Eating before going out into the cold. Which of these behaviors can make you more susceptible to frostbite? Nicotine can actually decrease blood flow to the skin, which makes it harder for your body to stay warm. Alcohol and caffeine have the same effect. So if you're going out in the cold, stay away from cocktails, cigarettes, and coffee, and stick with hot chocolate. It's late afternoon, and snow is starting to accumulate. Watch out! You're hoping to make it back from work before it gets too heavy. of this hill. Watch out, guys. Here comes another one. When wet snow meets cold road, oh, people don't even try. The danger begins. Look out, look out. Driving down an icy hill? What would you do to avoid becoming a frozen pinball? Should you A. Hit the brakes and ride them hard, B. Put the car in neutral and coast to the bottom, or C. Put the car in low gear and point the wheels straight downhill? So what's the deal with slippery downhill drives? Ice is the most dangerous characteristic of a winter storm as far as travel is concerned. Uh, just a very, very thin glaze of ice down onto a road surface can turn it into a skating rink. From the latest statistics we've seen, well over a thousand people, unfortunately, are killed in uh, snow-related accidents every winter, and well over a hundred thousand are injured in those same types of accidents. Oh, no. Oh, jeez. Oh! Driving uphill or downhill is one of the most dangerous things a driver can do in icy or snowy conditions, for sure. When you're driving on a level surface, gravity is your friend. When you're driving uphill or downhill, gravity can cause you to lose control and get into a crash or injure yourself or others. And here you are stuck on an icy hill trying to get a grip in dangerous conditions. 
So how can you survive skidding down an icy road? Your best course of action is C, downshift and point your wheels downhill. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an absolute disaster. When you encounter a downhill slope that's ice covered, shifting down is ideal. Slowing your speed prior to even entering the hill or getting to the hill is very ideal. If you can enter the hill at a slow speed and then shift down and just point your wheels to downhill, what you'll find is your engine will rev up fairly high. That's not a concern. That's something you want it to do. You want the engine to essentially slow the vehicle down and keep those tires rolling. One of the biggest mistakes motorists can make is turning too hard to the right or too hard to the left. Wheels are designed to roll end over end. When you turn the wheel too hard right or left, what you're doing is you're causing the wheel to be sideways. That's what's going to cause you to lose traction and run out of control and potentially you get in a crash. It's better as you're going down the hill to look for fresh snow, look for a part of the roadway that maybe hasn't been driven on as much so you're not encountering the packed slick conditions that you would encounter coming down the hill and driving in other tracks. But how can using your brakes be a bad thing? When you're descending down a hill with icy conditions, anytime you apply brakes, your wheels could stop turning and then you'll lose it. You lose your traction and that's when you start to lose control. coasting downhill in neutral. You do not want to put it in neutral. By keeping the car in gear, what you're doing is you're engaging the natural ability for the car to regulate its speed via the motor. Obviously, that along with tapping your brakes here and there just to maintain a slow speed, you're going to be able to negotiate that hill much, much more safely and efficiently. So you managed to get it in gear driving downhill. To make it up safely, should you A. Alternate between tapping the gas and the brakes B. Pop it into low gear and drive really slow Or C. Accelerate at the bottom of the hill and ride the momentum up You're not gonna make it up the hill! Don't forget, it's best if you're not out in these conditions at all Wait till roads are clear of ice before venturing out But if you must drive best bet to make it up is C. Accelerate at the bottom of the hill and ride the momentum up. Turn into it. There you go. Other way, other way. Other way. There you go. Quick, turn quick to hand over hand. There you go. Good job. Okay, quick, quick, quick. Definitely accelerating at the bottom of the hill is going to be better for your traction because you're going on a level surface and then when you start to encounter the hill, that momentum is going to carry you up there as far as it can. Lightly touch the accelerator. Try to keep those wheels moving and in contact with the road. Driving uphill on ice is all about building momentum and maintaining traction. As you start to approach an icy hill, it's important to measure your car ability to go up the hill at the very bottom of the hill. As you start up the hill, gently accelerate and sense what kind of grip and traction you're getting. The worst thing is to get halfway up the hill and have your vehicle lose traction and now you become literally a passenger in your vehicle sliding back down the hill. A lot of people look for the tracks that are existing when they start to go up a hill. Unfortunately, when multiple vehicles are going down those same tracks, it compacts the snow and turns it into almost an icy surface. It's very slick. You're going to be better off to try to find a spot where the wheels have not gone to provide more traction. You got it. 
Driving low and slow worked well downhill. Why not use it going uphill? When you shift into a lower gear, you're causing the vehicle to apply more torque to the wheels. And when you press on the accelerator, it causes the wheels to spin a lot more aggressively, and you're not going to be able to make it up the hill. So you want to choose the appropriate gear to be able to climb the hill without the wheels spinning. As for going back and forth between the gas and the brakes, the problem with doing a gas brake pattern is you could apply the brakes too hard and cause them to skid, and then you're going to lose traction. That's up! Driving on icy hills can cause serious injury to you and your wallet. Staying off the roads altogether is your safest bet in these conditions. But if you lose control going downhill, shift the car into low gear and point your wheels down the slope. trying to make it uphill, accelerate at the bottom and maintain that pace until you reach the top. trip for ages and now you're almost on top of the world you're climbing toward a mountain peak thousands of feet above sea level 19,583 feet above sea level yes it's been an exhausting journey but it's about to get worse much worse your muscles cramp up you feel dizzy and sick to your stomach. This is altitude sickness. Uh. Choose to do the wrong thing now, and it could be lethal. Should you A. Climb at a slower pace so your body has time to adjust. B. Hike down the mountain as fast as you can. Or C, stay where you are until your symptoms subside. Altitude sickness is basically your body attempting to compensate for this lack of oxygen. Since your body doesn't have as much, uh, it doesn't have what it needs to drive its normal processes. Altitude sickness really has a whole host of problems, signs, and symptoms. Probably the most important is that the person reaching a high altitude feels really fatigued and really short of breath. People often talk about that high altitude fog where they feel like they're in a fog, they're feeling spacey. <sighs> So tired, it's ridiculous. You end up with a situation where the person becomes progressively more disoriented and also ends up with something called gait ataxia, basically meaning they get extremely clumsy. You can test by having them walk a line. You know, just like um, pretend you're a cop. Have them walk the line. Yeah, walk in a line. First, and then you're going to walk after me? I, I remember it. There's two other more radical forms of altitude sickness known as HAPE, which is high altitude pulmonary edema, or HACE, which is high altitude cerebral edema. And both of those, if not dealt with immediately, can lead to death. Good question. I need to get some new music. <laughs> what? Water. Wizard. Wizard? <laughs> what is it called? It's too bad. Wazazer. Besides slurred speech, I can't talk normally. 
Patients will often suffer from dizziness, headaches, and in fact, that may move on to seizures and coma. So it can be very life-threatening and devastating. sick as a dog. So what would you do right now to survive? Your best course of action is B. Hike down to a lower elevation immediately. The best treatment for high altitude sickness is to get down from that altitude as fast as possible. The faster you get down, the better you are, and the symptoms actually can abate or lessen. It's only five minutes left. I think you can make it. Okay, five minutes post. The problem is, uh, on big mountains especially, you may have planned for this for years and been saving your money for the, for the longest time, and you just don't want to admit to the fact that you have to turn around. But you have to turn around. It's the only way to deal with altitude sickness is to get down, to descend. Choose to climb higher or even stay where you are and you could be in dire trouble. If you decide to stay at the mountain even though you're having profound symptoms, the symptoms will inevitably get worse. So your brain symptoms, your respiratory symptoms, your circulatory symptoms, all of those things together will lead to unresponsiveness and shock. Even expert climbers can be caught off guard by this deadly condition. Seriously, it can affect anyone at any time, even if you've never had it before. An experienced mountaineer can go many years without having it, and then one day just descend to even 8,000 feet and feel sick. Actually, I can barely breathe right now. Always stay hydrated and ascend slowly to help prevent an attack of altitude sickness. But if you feel the effects of the dangerous condition, head back down as quickly as possible. There's no shame in turning around when your life is on the line. by a frigid arctic storm you've done the smart thing and hunkered down at home when mother nature turns off the lights now you're trapped inside the power's out and the temperature's dropping fast. There's no way to know when the power will come back on. So you have to ask yourself, what should you do to endure a winter power outage? Should you A, store your frozen food outside in a snowbank, B, hunker down in one room to conserve heat, or C, D, use an outdoor grill indoors to keep warm and cook food before it spoils. Cold can be a key.
killer. So what do you need to know to live through an ice storm's aftermath? You know, what happens in an ice storm is it's actually warm higher up in the atmosphere. Snow falls and it melts. It turns into rain. That rain will come down, and as long as your surface temperature is above freezing, you're okay. But once it drops below freezing, that rain actually freezes on contact on branches and power lines. There it is. The, the entire state, well, at least in our area, is pretty much coated in ice. The wires, the lines, the branches break down and take out power lines. Ice becomes incredibly heavy. Even a few inches weighs several hundred pounds when stretched out over the length of the electrical cord and can easily knock out power grids for days or weeks on end. Which brings us back to you. And there's 100,000 people out of power in this area, most of them in the Greensboro area, which I'm in. Stuck at home, powerless, with no idea when it'll all be over. What would you do to survive this Arctic ordeal? The best thing to do in a winter power outage is be stay in one room and ride it out. If you've lost power and you have no heat or a limited heat source, it's so important that you immediately make the decision to zone off your house and literally live out of one room. The best way to do that is hang blankets in the doorways, close all the doors, and literally confine all of your living activity to one room. Have some extra blankets nearby as part of your survival kit. Sleeping bags are a great insulator. During a power outage, everything for your health applies. You should have plenty of water during the day. Take care of your health. Take care of yourself. And if it gets too severe or too inconvenient, then go to a shelter. You're hungry and cold. Wouldn't using an outdoor grill solve both of those problems? Some people may be inclined to heat their home with a barbecue or something like that understand that these devices are not intended to heat a home they can produce dangerous gases such as carbon monoxide which is obviously deadly carbon monoxide is a byproduct of combustion it's created by engines propane stoves and even charcoal grills every year around 480 people are killed due to carbon monoxide and over 15,000 people are injured as for storing food in a snowbank your fridge is still the best place for it. Most power outages are pretty short in duration. If you have a good refrigerator, it should hold the food cold for up to four hours. And if your freezer is full, that could stay frozen for up to two days. In times like this, having an emergency kit can make all the difference. We always talk about having an emergency kit prepared. Pull it out. Certainly you should have some kind of a battery-powered radio so that you can get local news and information. This is when, like we always say, it's time to be prepared. If an ice storm knocks your power out, stay indoors, preferably in one room away from windows that lose heat. Don't bring propane or cold grills indoors. And don't try and store frozen food outside in the snow keep it in the fridge and no matter what never touch a frozen or down power line because braving the cold is hazard enough it's a crisp fall morning as you drive into work with only a light drizzle to contend with it looks like smooth sailing that is, until you hit the overpass. You're sliding on black ice. To avoid crashing, would you? A. Accelerate through the icy patch. B. Ease off the gas and allow yourself to coast right through it. Or C. Hit the brakes and stop as quickly as possible. 
Icy roads cause a quarter million crashes a year. But what is black ice, and why is it so treacherous? Black ice refers to ice that's developed on the surface of a roadway. Now, black ice is actually transparent, but it takes on the color of the underlying surface. When the ice starts to get wet from the outside temperatures warming up slightly, ice gets very, very slick as the tires hit. Can't do their job and really provide the grip and thus traction that gives you control and safety. And they typically happen at night and in the early morning hours when the temperatures really drop. Temperatures get below 32 degrees. That's the freezing mark. You can see actually water start to freeze on the surface of the roadways. It does not have to be raining or snowing for black ice to occur. It could be a snowbank that is sitting on the side of the road that melts and comes across the road during the day, and then that could refreeze during the night. And so it's a very subtle but dangerous situation. When it comes to black ice, not all roads are made alike. The most susceptible areas to see black ice are typically bridges and overpasses because they not only cool from the top surface, but the undersurface as well. So they cool the quickest, and that's where you're going to see that formation. Snow and ice that has been packed down at intersections gets polished where vehicles stop and start constantly because tires are spinning. Massive accident, massive, multiple car accidents, multiple vehicles, cars all over the place, jackknife tractor trailer, that car's in crush, they had the jaws of life, that guy out of there. There are several situations I see every winter where black ice causes multiple car pileups. The skies were clear, the winds were calm, we had some snow yesterday, there was probably some moisture on the road. You can put all those together and actually determine that it was black ice. And here you are. out of control. What would you do if you found yourself sliding on dangerous black ice? Believe it or not, B, coasting with your foot off the gas is the right way to go. ways to really approach black ice is to slow down all of your reactions, gently lift off the accelerator, and essentially try to coast through, not make any kind of rash movement, and glide through the area so that you can get as much grip as possible. If you lift quickly off the gas pedal, you'll upset the balance of your vehicle. Gently lifting off the gas settles the vehicle and allows you to let all four patches of the tires that are in contact with the road work together. Loss of traction is the biggest reason why both speeding through and hitting the brakes are bad calls. Sometimes people think the easiest way to handle black ice is to get through it quickly. Accelerating and getting on the gas as you go through black ice is the wrong thing because you won't have traction. Your tires will spin and you'll be in a situation where your vehicle is very imbalanced. Slamming on the brakes in an ice situation takes away the grip, takes away control. If you have the need to use the brakes, use them gently. And then once you feel the vehicle regain grip with the pavement, you can resume normal speed and continue on. One thing is clear. Every driver should know what to do if you encounter black ice. The biggest thing I, thing I see with black ice and, and it causing crashes is the surprise factor. Panicking is one of the worst things you can do when you en encounter any kind of slick road conditions such as black ice. If you maintain a cool head, you're actually going to maintain better control if you somewhat coast it out. When moisture meets cold road, you may find black 
black ice. I use my car thermometer, and if I see that car thermometer temperature dropping to 33, 32, then I know these surfaces are beginning to freeze up, and I take a little more caution. So slow down, be aware, and be ready to act. If you start to slide, slowly take your foot off the gas and ride it out. Don't slam on your brakes. Don't try to make rash movements with the steering wheel. Don't do things that are going to upset the balance of your vehicle. These things will just lead to you becoming a passenger in your vehicle and no longer being the driver and being in control.